deep in the beshadowed places of the woods, there is a ghost. It could be anywhere in this darkling forest, haunting, waiting, feeding. And you will never find it near the light. To find this ghost, you must go to the dark places, the places where the canopies of the trees cover the land, and best of those places where very little light ever touches the soil. These are the deep and shadow places of the ancient forest. To find these ghosts, Daphne and I set out near sundown, looking for hidden paths and brooks and springs, where the duff of the woodland lies deep upon the land, and there we found it. The white ghost, a phantom that steals its life from the fungal threads that lie beneath the soil like a vampire, and through them steals the life acquired by the trees, whose green leaves far overhead in the sunshine would have made nourishment from the light. As day waned, we trekked ever deeper into the forest, Daphne and I, and marking our way were the cries of coyotes and the watchful eyes of nocturnal things. In guiding our way, we had only a hope and the fey light of bags full of fireflies. Of course, what I'm speaking of is Monotropa uniflora, otherwise known as the ghost pipe, and it likes best mature forests where the sun rarely touches the land with any strength. You'll often find it on sphagnum moss, or among the deep leaves and deep duff of pine needles, and growing in places you might find wintergreen, bunchberry, and Canada mayflower. Wherever it grows, the ghost pipe is often mistaken for a fungus. It's not hard to imagine why, with its pale, ghostly white appearance, sometimes leaning toward pinks and reds, sometimes specked in stripes with hues of black and purple, and other times as pure white as the ephemeral mist of a cloud. And just like fungi, it may grow singularly or in groups. But the ghost pipe is indeed a plant, a very unusual, vampiric kind of plant. It grows best where the forest is deep and dark because sunlight is harsh on its pale body. But more importantly, it establishes a mycorrhizal relationship with the threads of fungi that are found everywhere in the soil of a healthy woodland. But whereas many plants form mutually beneficial relationships with these fungi, the ghost pipe is a thief of life. It forms what is called a mycoheterotrophic relationship with the underground fungi, giving nothing we know of back to the fungus nor to the trees and plants those fungi support. Rather, it steals their nutrients. The monotropa sports a single flower upon a stem, and right in the center there is a substantial stigma, surrounded by 10 to 12 stamens with yellow-brown anthers. Sometimes the anthers darken with age, and sometimes not. And if we peel the anthers away, we can see a scalloped, bell-shaped seed in the middle. Here I've removed the stem to help it stand out. It's quite hard, hard as a nut. As this plant has no need for sunlight, its leaves are delicate and translucent pale bracts, more like the ghostly memories of a leaf. When young and prior to fertilization, the pentagon-shaped lip of the stigma will be pale. And as you can see here, after fertilization, it turns dark. It emerges from the ground with a fully formed but unfertilized flower hanging upside down like a bell. As the flower is fertilized and begins to develop a seed, it takes on a pinkish color and the flower begins to stand up. And as the seeds harden and reach maturity, they swell and stand upright. Here we see two clusters of monotropa. On the left is a group with seeds mostly still in development. And on the right we can see the majority of flowers have stood up, meaning their seeds are well into development. From top down, they face straight up at the camera and are hard as nuts. The stem is solid, with a pale flesh and no distinct divisions at least not unless observed with magnification. The ghost pipe is usually white, and sometimes there are pink and red variants, and often there are dark purple spots up and down the stem, or as seen here, broken purple lines attempting to spiral down the stem. The plant tends to emerge after a period of rain following a dry spell, and grows quickly, taking only a couple days to reach full size. And its ability to grow so rapidly must undoubtedly be one of the reasons it is so often confused for a fungus. Because the way of fungi to pop up virtually overnight is well known. When young, the plant can be cooked as a pot herb, though you might prefer to give it a boil first and drain it to remove some of the acridity, but it tastes much like asparagus. And at any age, it can be gathered fairly quickly for a variety of other uses. 
Most notably, Monotropa uniflora has medicinal uses and is often drawn upon by herbalists to relieve emotional pain as well as physical pain. It is said to have an interesting effect in dealing with both these types of pain. Unlike narcotics, which have many kinds of complications, including the potential to be addictive, persons that use tincture of Monotropa uniflora often state that it's not as if it makes these pains go away, but rather as if it sets them on a shelf in a corner of the mind where they just don't matter anymore. It's too late in the season and the stems are too tough to use it for food, so let's gather a batch and make a tincture. Different herbalists recommend using different parts. Daphne, who is well into her own herbalist studies, prefers to use the most aerial parts, the flowers. Preparation is simple. Cut away the stems to about an inch or two to three centimeters below the flowers. Simply gather them up and drop them into a small jar. Whatever part you choose to use based on your own research, fill the jar all the way to the top. Tinctures are best processed when there is as little room for oxygen as possible in the container. Then fill the jar all the way to the top with a powder by alcohol, such as rum, vodka, or anything else 80 proof or better. Make sure the alcohol covers everything in the jar and then seal it up. And finally, take the jar and put it in a cool dark place to age. Once a day, for the first three or four days, give the jar a gentle shake, just enough to help loosen up any air bubbles that might be hiding among the plants. You'd be surprised how easily they can sneak in there, and if they remain, they can cause rot. And overall, you should let the tincture age for four to six weeks, leaning toward the latter. But by day two, you will undoubtedly notice a remarkable change has taken place. The tincture will have become a deep indigo blue, meaning that the tincture is progressing correctly. When the tincture is adequately aged, strain it to remove all solids and transfer the liquid into small vials. Small vials are best because they minimize the amount of air that's in the vial. Always remember, oxygen contaminates alcohol, so you want to keep the oxygen content very low. Herbalists recommend three drops to a milliliter for physical pain and up to two doses per day of one milliliter each for psychological pain. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy The Naturalist Program, please take a moment to subscribe. It costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps.